thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okie dokie. Well, Come welcome. Come here. I want you. Did, did you hear something there? Yes. Somebody called up. What did they, what did they say? Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson. What, what did they say? Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. Well, that's me, Mr. Watson. Thomas Watson's my name. I, I, and of course, the person calling was my boss, Mr. Alexander Graham Bell. He called me, and those words became some of the most famous words ever spoken in history. And, I, and I'm going to be telling you why. Uh, you see, he needed my help. He needed my help. And of course, uh, I, I tell you what, uh, look at the person next to you, okay? Look at the person next to you. What do they know about that you don't? And what do you know about that they don't? How could you help each other? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to find out what the person next to you knows that you don't. Off you go. Find out now. What are they experts in? Okay, hold it there. So now you know who to go to for help, yeah? Because you've got to do that. You know, it, this is what uh, my, my boss went, said as well. If you ever need help, you just got to... Oh dear, I think we better do that one again. If you need help, you got to... You can do better than that. If you need help, just... Exactly, and that's the advice which was given to my boss by this man, Professor Joseph Henry. He's one of the guys who invented the telegraph, many more things besides. You see, my boss went to see him with an a, invention of his. It's called the harmonic telegraph. Now, Mr. Bell, uh, he, he, he was, he was uh, very pleased to be showing him this, uh, this new invention, but, but he had some other ideas. You see, he thought that using this technology, he may be able to, to, to send not just the electrical signals, but sound itself. Maybe he could invent a telephone, something for sending sound across the wires. Well, Mr. Joseph Henry, he thought this was a fantastic idea. He said, here is the germ of a great invention. But Alec Bell, he said, I fear I lack the necessary electrical knowledge. You see, he knew about sound, not electricity. And what did Professor Henry tell him then? Get it. Exactly. And he got me. Thomas Watson is my name. I am an electrical engineer. You see, Mr. Bell, he knew all about sound. I knew all about electricity. You put the sound and the electricity together. Could you perhaps create a telephone? Telephone. What does it mean? Well, of course, tele. Tele means at a distance. Uh, some of you, who's got a television? Who's got, yeah. So you see things at a distance. Uh, of course, telegraph we had is for writing at a distance. Telephonic is to do with transmitting sound itself at a distance. Telecommunication. Anybody here work in telecommunication? Yeah, I thought so, I thought so. Of course, we got lots of different ways of, of communicating at a distance. Let me show you. Can I have 11 volunteers, please? I need 11 volunteers. Come on, up you go. You come and stand behind the table there, yep. Let's have some more. We, we're going to need 11. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Go and stand behind the table there. Okay, let's have a young lady. You can come and stand over here. That's right. And who else have we got here? Right. So I need five people behind each table. Five people behind. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I need two more, please. Yes, sir. You go and take up a station behind this table here. There you go. You come and stand over here. There's your instructions there. That's it. One, two, three, four, five. And one more over here. Okay. So how do we communicate at a distance? Well, of course, there is the simple way of simply... Shouting, exactly. Or shouting like this. Come on. You can your hands around your mouth. Ah! <laughs> Cup your hands around your mouth. Give a round of applause. Focusing the sound. And if that ain't good enough, you might have to use, use this. Use an 
megaphone. Come on, use it. Use a megaphone. Give a round of applause. <laughs> yep, that's right. Even, yes, uh, this is uh, this is how we communicate using loud sounds. <laughs> yeah, even animals got in on the act. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Well, of course, uh, that's so. <laughs> You always got one, yeah? The trouble is, it's always him, yeah. <laughs> now, of course, that's all very well if you can hear people, if you're close enough to hear them. But what if you couldn't use the, the, the sound that they're making? Then other kinds of signals might be used. For example... Make smoke signals. Show us! Which is all very well, unless... It rains. Give them a round of applause. There you go. Or, of course, you could use jungle drums. Now, you may think jungle drums are just used in the jungle. It ain't so, sir. The military have used drums for many years to send signals to tell the rest of the soldiers what to do. But in the heat of the battle, you may need to use something which is even more penetrating in its sound than a drum. Wow, give him a round of applause. Can you give us something a bit louder and higher, sir? I think you can. This is fantastic. This. Okay, round of applause. Yep. And of course, a whole series of signals were worked out for people to use uh, brass instruments and trumpets. And that was not the only sound that we used. There you go, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you got this kind of thing. <laughs> Any sports people around you might hear that, and of course on the ships you may hear something like this. <whistles> Piping the uh, people aboard. You may think this is old fashioned, but next time you get the chance, have a listen to the next episode of Star Trek. Okay, and of course this soon became a popular sound around the country. Exactly. And where do you hear that? On trains. Now, of course, trains, when they first came out, they also needed people to be walking in front of them with a red flag. The red flag rule was, was, was proposed. Now, you may think that's dangerous, walking in front of a, mo a moving train or, or indeed a road vehicle uh, with a red flag, but don't worry, because the speed limit at the time was four miles per hour. Yeah, except in the city where it was two miles an hour. Yeah, it's okay. It went up to 14 a little bit later. But there we are. Give them a big round of applause, my volunteers, please. Thank you. Go sit down. Go sit down. Thank you very much indeed. Well, you know, this is, this is all very well. But how could you communicate at a distance? Oh, here's something we, we forgot to show you. There's a sound thing. Here you go. Uh, young lady there. There you go. Of course, you may have seen this, and you can make some of these yourselves. There you go. Stretch it out. Put it to your ear, madam. But that, yes, your ear. That's right. <laughs> Tell people your name. Brenda. Give a round of applause to Brenda. Fantastic. A way of speaking at a distance. And you know, this was actually used. People used this. They had, they had cables and uh, stretched out taut to communicate from factories. But of course, you've got you to be in a straight line. The advantage of this kind is that you can actually communicate around corners. You want to put this to your ear, sir? <clears throat> and repeat after me. In 1627, Francis Bacon, Bacon. 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 <laughs> predicted the use of speaking tubes. Predicted the use of speaking tubes in his smash hit book. In his smash hit book, Utopia. Utopia. And he loved the way that they could speak around corners. And he loved the way they could speak around corners. Give a round of applause! There is a telecom professional, if ever I saw one. It's true, these were predicted way back in 1627, and of course they were used. Houses can communicate from floor to floor. Uh, submarines use speaking tubes. So there's plenty of ways that we've been communicating at a, at a, at a distance. Uh, but even these, these techniques require, they require a, a, some visuals, they require some sound, but they're not very sophisticated, are they? So, people invented things which were much more sophisticated, such as 
international alphabet of flags. What does that say? H. H. Correct. You got it. Which put together spells? Hello. And of course, you've also got numbers and other various signals which can be, which can be included to uh, uh, give the, 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 the flags a second meaning. Uh, then, of course, uh, a, a language was invented of flags called semaphore, which, as you can see, can be done by uh, young ladies or boys or even people with no legs at all. Yeah. So, uh, let me see. Uh, what, would, uh, what would this say? Okay. Let's see if I can get this right here. S. <clears throat> what? <laughs> N. Exactly. N. Uh... I it is. C. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. So semaphore is a language which was created and can be used as well. Uh, oh, and there they are. N I C E spells nice. Then, of course, you got this code, Morse code. This was invented, of course, by uh, Samuel Morse in 1837, along with Joseph Henry. You saw him earlier on. He's the guy who said, Get the help. And uh, you probably know some Morse code signals. Uh, you, the, uh, the little dots, you say them like a dip, and the, and the dashes, of course, you say like a da. So, what is dip, dip, dip? S. S. Da, da, da. Dit, dit, dit. Yes. Which means? Help. help. It means help. It means save our souls. And it's the still internationally recognized sign for help. Uh, maybe you know this one. Dit, 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 da. What's that? It, what? <laughs> Very close. What is it? Dit, 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 da. It's V for Vic. No, it isn't. It's, well, it's not quite Elgar. It's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Da, 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 da. Exactly. And it's V for victory. Well, uh, of course, this became more sophisticated too. You could have some uh, 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 punctuation added if you wanted to. Now, you may think that Morse code is rather tricky to learn, but there are uh, people come up with some pretty ingenious ways of learning it. Look, dit da is A, da dit 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 is B, da dit da dit is C, and so forth. And uh, this one I rather like. Look, if you've got a dit, uh, you, you follow it this way. If you've got a da, you follow it that way. Uh, so. Uh, so we get a, uh, let me see, we get a, 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 we might say, dit, dit, da is a U, or a da, da, dit is a G, and so forth. So, uh, who'd like to have a go at Morse and semaphore? I tell you what, here's another way of showing Morse. Look at this. You see, you didn't have to just say dit and da, you could simply flash the signal. A short flash and a long flash. Who'd like to have a go at the Morse code? I need four people for Morse code, please. You want to have another go? You can come up. Come on. Up you come, please. Here you go. So you'll find your code written on there. And I need, uh, I need five people for the semaphore flags. Come and, come and help yourself to one of these. I'm going to get one something from back here. There you go. And I need five people for the flags, for the pennant flags. Five more volunteers, please. Up you come. Yes. One more over there. Go and find yourself those. There you go. There's number one there. There you go. So find your piece of card and practice your signal. It's written on the back. Let's have another four. Here you go. So this is yours, sir. You come and stand here. And you come and here, you, you hold two. That one in that hand, that one in that hand. That one in that hand, that one in. One more, one more volunteer, please. Yes, sir. Give him a round of applause. There you go. Okay. And so this, uh, this is going to be, uh, 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 this is a, a whole load of ways of transmitting at a distance. So, this was a great idea, but it was a little bit. Would you like to go first, madam? Switch it on. There's your code. Oh, wait a minute, you're number four. Who's number one? Who's number one? Okay, you go first. You go first. Do it again. You've got a three quick ones. Three. 
One, two, three. Which spells? S. Who's number two? Number two, off you go. Do it again. That was a da and a dit. What was it? Are you number two? <laughs> yeah, that's a dit, a da, a dit, and a dit. Slow, long, slow, to quick, quick. What's that? Da. It is indeed L. Yep. Number three. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Do it again. Actually, that's a dit. And a dit. Oh, no, no, no. Start again. It's a dit. Oh, sorry. You know, you're right. It's a dar and a dar and a dar, which is? Oh, and the last one. Dit. Da. Da, which spells? W. w. <laughs> Slow. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Put him on the table there. And uh, rather. Can you read that? What's this one? It's a T. Well spotted, sir. What's this one? It's an O. U. G. Which put together spells? Tough. Give him a round of applause. Okay. <laughs> and finally, finally, this have these people sitting in the front here. Would you like to come up? You've got something written on the back of your chair there. You just leave it there. Leave it there. Okay. And you got something on the back of your chairs? Let's give them some semaphore flags. There you go. Copy mirror? what you see, just copy exactly as you see, as if you were looking in a mirror. So you no need to mirror it. There you go. And this one. Whew. Okay. Who can read this? <laughs> What's this letter? <laughs> L, indeed it is. It's not quite an O. It's an E indeed. Come on. Yes, well spotted there, it's an A. R, and finally, N. Indeed, give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go and sit down. Yes, indeed. All of these signals, absolutely wonderful, but are rather slow and tough to learn. So, uh, how could we, uh, how could we improve this? Well, of course, these, these actually work. They work fine. They work fine. But what if you really want to communicate at a distance, a big distance? Well, you might need a, a messenger. Ah. I forgot something. Can I have another volunteer? Here, could you take this for a second? And go and look at that there. Okay. Well, of course. Yep, go on. Follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. Okay. So, how are you going to communicate at a big distance? Well, you might need a messenger, right? You might need a messenger. Well, that's all very well, but the messenger, he's got to travel across land. He might be riding a horse. He's got to go across the seas, perhaps. All this is going to take time, and it's going to be difficult, yeah? Uh, you, some people may, they came up with this idea. A message in a bottle, yeah? Not very reliable. But instead, we came up uh, with a fantastic idea. Let me just see if my secret guy is ready. Are you ready? Okie dokie. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, our special guest star. Give him a round of applause. Round of applause. Flap your wings. Fly around. Here he goes. Flap your wings. This way. Yes. Find a member of the audience. Deliver your message, sir. Yes. Here he goes. Ladies and gentlemen. And deliver the message. Open the tubes, sir. Stay where you are, sir. Open the tubes. Stand up and read out the message, sir. Pull it out here. Yes. Extract the message and read it out in your biggest, loudest voice. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Pigeon, that is a medal. And inside the tube, sir, you'll find a medal. Oh, it is just well not. Give him a round of applause for the pigeon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, you may have thought that pigeons were, 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 uh, uh, were never given medals, but they were. 32 pigeons were awarded medals in World War II for gallantry. This is called the Dickin Medal. It was uh, uh, founded by Mariah Dickin uh, from the uh, PDSA, and uh, the 32 pigeons won them. Here's one of them, William of Orange. He won a medal for delivering a message from Operation Market Garden, which sadly failed, uh, but uh, he, he, he won a medal for his gallantry. But people have used pigeons for many centuries. Cyrus the Great in the sixth century, king of Persia, uh, Julius Caesar, both used pigeons to send messages from one end of the empire to the other. And of course, famously in the Siege of Paris, the French used messenger pigeons. Over a thousand pigeons were sent in the period of just four months of the siege. The only way to get out of the time was by balloon. But the pigeons could do it, you see. And of course, they were used in the wars. The French advanced 72 pigeon lofts in the, uh, 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 with, with the troops to the, to the front line. Uh, the US Army, they took 600 pigeons across from the US to use for communications in the First World War. Uh, one of these, one, his, name was, uh, uh, his name was Cher Ami. He won the Croix de Guerre, which is the highest military honor you can get in France. Uh, he, he, he actually delivered his message from the Battle of uh, uh, Verdun, and despite being shot, and, and he, he was injured, his, his leg was falling into pieces, and yet he still delivered his message, which saved 198 US soldiers. And there they go, you can see the, uh, the little canisters there that they use. This one even has a, uh, a, microfil uh, a, a camera here, so it can be sent over enemy territory to spy. And of course, there's so many ways of launching them, from the lofts, by hand, from a tank itself, and one of the most dangerous, from aircraft. You gotta know which kind of aircraft you're in, whether you throw your pigeon up or you throw your pigeon down so it doesn't get destroyed by the propellers. And in fact, whole instruction manuals were written as to how to launch your pigeon in a safe way. Yeah. So these messenger pigeons were essential in the time of war. Um, in fact, if you shot a pigeon, you could face up to six months in prison or a hundred pound fine. So, you know, we got a lot to thank these pigeons for. Here's another great pigeon. This is Paddy, the fastest pigeon to come back uh, from the D-Day landings. He crossed 230 miles of the English Channel in just four hours and 50 minutes. And there he is, Paddy, an Irish pigeon there. You can go and see him. And of course, we had our American heroes too. There we're in the Dickon Medal is, uh, is, is, is our... Uh, our very own uh, G.I. Joe, as he's known, he, in his time, saved 1,000 soldiers' lives. So I think you'll agree we have a lot to thank the pigeons for. And even Her Majesty the Queen uh, thanked them too. There's, uh, there's Paddy again, and, uh, and, and, and a colleague of his uh, 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 called Gustav. And there you go. Let's have a hear it for the pigeons, please. The carrier pigeons. Well, of course, Something was about to come along which would change all of that, and that was electricity. In 1800, this fellow here, Alessandro Giuseppe Antonio Anastasio Volta, yeah, he had a lot of names. He also had a lot of money. He was a wealthy count in Italy, and he uh, got together uh, with, 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 with a colleague of his. He met up with Mr. Galvani here, and Mr. Galvani was hanging some frog's legs onto the, uh, onto the iron fence. He had some lovely brass hooks, and he'd hang them off his iron fence, and the, the neighbors didn't like it at all. But uh, he was quite amazed. When he hung it off the iron fence, what happened? The frog's legs just kicked like that. And he took it off and he put it back and it kicked. And he thought, wow, there must be some kind of electricity actually trapped inside the leg, inside the, uh, the, the nerves of the, of the muscles. He called it animal electricity. And he, he, he inspired galvanists around the world to try to recreate life. And in fact, he inspired a certain Mary Shelley to write a book uh, called uh, Prometheus, a life uh, regain, which we know as Frankenstein. The story of Frankenstein inspired by Mr. Galvani there. Uh, but of course, Volta, he came along and he said, now wait a minute, he said, do not de hang it on the, the iron fence. Here, you try to hang it on the, the brass fence. And he did so. He hung it on the iron fence and he kicked. And he hung it on the brass fence, and nothing happened. 
and he hanged it on the iron fence, and it kicked, and he hanged it on the brass fence, and nothing happened. And uh, Mr. Volter had realized that it wasn't electricity trapped inside the, the nerves of the frog's legs. No, this electricity was being created when the two different metals met. And he tested a load of combinations of metal on his tongue, and he found which ones gave him a bigger shock uh, than others, and he invented this. It is called a pile, and it is the world's first battery. And now people had a, a way of creating electricity whenever uh, and whenever they wanted to. Basically, it was a series of discs, copper and zinc discs, and in between uh, was some cardboard or felt, which was uh, uh, soaked in some kind of conducting liquid. You salt water, for example. <laughs> of course, uh, Alexander Volder, he used uh, sulfuric acid, yeah. Yeah, who's heard of sulfuric acid? Yeah, very dangerous. Remember this, yeah, comes important in the story later on. What's the chemical uh, formula for uh, sulfuric acid? H2SO4. H2SO4, exactly right. Uh, what's your name, sir? A uh, Oliver here. Now, uh, uh, Oliver, what's, what's the chemical formula for water? H2O. H2O. Right. Oliver was a schoolboy. Oliver is no more. For what he thought was H2O, was H2SO4. <coughs> if you drank H2SO4, Oliver, you'd end up very severely dead. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, this battery revolutionized things, and uh, here he is, Mr. Uh, Volder, uh, showing, Count Volder, I should say, showing his invention to the Emperor Napoleon. And uh, this allowed people to use the electricity wherever and whenever they wanted it. But the next great discovery was made by this fellow, Hans Christian Ørsted, in Denmark. He was a hatter, and he made an astounding discovery. He found that if electricity went through a wire and he put a compass needle by the wire, it would actually deflect the compass needle. When the electricity flows this way, it, it deflects it in this direction. Make it flow the other way and it deflects in the opposite direction. He had discovered, what's it called? Electromagnetism, exactly. May I have another volunteer, please? Yes, give him a round of applause. Watch out for the wires. Up you come. So, what I got here, I got some uh, little bit of copper wire uh, wrapped around in, uh, in, a, in a coil here. And there's some there, and there's some there. And it's all wrapped on some pieces of, uh, some, some nice piece of iron, okay? Now, when we, uh, when we press this button here, then the little light comes on to show you electricity is flowing around these coils, okay? So can you just hold that and have a go of switching it on and off? Okay, so what I'd like you to do, uh, let's go over here. What's your name, sir? Evan. Evan. So Evan, first of all, make sure it's switched off. Do not switch it on. Okay, could you just show, hold it up high. Show the ladies and gentlemen here that that is not a magnet, you see? It is not picking up the spoon. Now, switch on the electric current, Evan. Now try. Give him a round of applause, please. And oh, pick it up using a magnetism. Electromagnetism, hold it up high. Hold it up high, bring it over here. And from up high, drop it into my hand. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a magnet. You can switch on and off. Give him a round of applause. An electromagnet. You can, you can make some of these for yourselves. You can make it if you like. You can make a small one, or you could even make something a little bit bigger. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> there it is being used in a, uh, a, 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 in a recycling yard. So, people uh, had discovered electromagnetism. When electricity flows, not only does it create heat, but it creates magnetism as well. And people began to use it. Over here in England, Mr. Michael Faraday, of course, he used the effect to create the world's first motor. And there it is. It was very simple. Simply a rod is part of a circuit going through some mercury liquid and uh, a magnet sitting in the middle of the bowl. And when he switched the current on, the, uh, the rod spins round and round the magnet. He had created the first electric motor. It wasn't very sophisticated, but it was a start. It was a start. And people went on to mix even more. Well, if we can create movement by simply switching on electric current, then we had all we needed to create a telegraph. We can switch on the current here, and it, it, it sends electricity through these through these coils, magnetize them, which will then pull this coil contact down here. 
so people could send messages by electricity. And of course, the, uh, the, uh, the big companies like Western Union were set up and they made a fortune laying cables across countries so people could communicate from one place to another. Yeah, it was wonderful. But um, So how could you go from, from, from creating that to creating sound going across a wire? You see, these, these telegraphs were fine for writing. The electricity is simply on or off. It simply sounds or not. But if you want to send sound across a wire, how could you do that? Well, a lot of people understood about electricity, but one man who understood about sound was Mr. Alexander Graham Bell. I'll tell you. Now, he was born in, in Edinburgh in Scotland, okay, in 1847. And he was always very interested in sound. One of the reasons was because his mother was deaf. Also, his father, his father worked with, with sound, with the voice. And in fact, he went on to marry a deaf woman too. So he was, uh, he was always interested in sound. Now, he went to school between the ages of 10 and 15. He didn't really get on at school. He did enjoy, though, he enjoyed art and poetry. Uh, he, uh, and music, he got a love of that from his mother. She was a very talented artist and pianist. And he loved learning. He used to sit in his grandfather's library and study there. He loved learning. He loved inventing things. Uh, and uh, by the way, <laughs> uh, he wasn't always Alexander Graham Bell. He was originally just Alexander Bell. Has anybody here uh, got three names? Who's got three names? Okay. Who's only got two names? Okay, who'd like an extra name? Yeah, <laughs> well, he wanted an extra name. And so he asked, he asked, and on his 11th birthday, uh, of course, one of the reasons he wanted it was his father had three names. So did his brothers, Melville James and Edward Charles. So he asked, and on his 11th birthday, he was given a third name, and he became Alexander Graham Bell, even though he was always simply known as Alec <laughs> to his friends. Well, his father... He also had three names. Alexander Melville Bell, he worked with sound, with, with the sound of the voice. And he created a way of writing down the sound that was coming from the human mouth. You see, if you think about it, when we speak, we, we use different shapes in our mouths. Uh, we have vowels and consonants, right? So what are the vowels? A, E, I, O, U. So everyone, exaggerate your mouths and say, a E I O U. Let's put them all together and use your hands to shape it in the air. A E I O U. And you see, you shape your mouths differently. With the consonants, it's the same. We have two kinds of consonants. We have the plosives, which last an instant. Can everyone say t t t t t t t? It's the tip of the tongue behind the top teeth. Say that. The tip of the tongue behind the top teeth. That's right. And if we put a voice with it, we get d d d d d d d. So we can do the same movement with and without the voice. T t d d t t d d t t d d. We also have a k sound. K k k k k k. The soft palate in the tongue. K k with a voice becomes g g. K k g g k k g g k k g g. And of course, the third plosive is a p sound. We're going to go. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Yeah, yeah. And we put it together, we get Then, of course, we have a lot of consonants which last for as long as we have breath. These are called the continuants. What are some of the continuants you can think of? Call them out. Shh. <laughs> exactly. With a voice that becomes vroom. Everyone make a vroom sound. Is that a nice face or a nasty face? Vroom. Yeah, it's a nasty face, isn't it, sir? Yeah. And so, of course, in English, we have a lot of nasty words which begin with the letter V. Repeat after me. Vile. Vile. Villain. Villain. Vomit. Vomit. Yeah, that's right. Lots of nasty sounds. Sorry, so early in the morning. Yeah. Um, uh, can anyone think of any nasty words beginning with the de-voiced ver version of a V? Beginning with an F. Any nasty words? <laughs> moving on, moving on. Yeah. You know, this is fabulous. Yeah. And we have mmm. Everyone repeat after me. Mmm. Uh, mmm. Mmm. Lots of different vowel sounds and consonant sounds. Well, Al Alexander Melville Bell, he worked out a way of actually writing down the speech. And he could use this 
to recreate any sounds. This was not language specific. He could actually uh, uh, write down any sound you like, even weird sounds. Can you make a weird sound, sir? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Yeah, I thought you could, yeah, yeah. You see, he could write that down and reproduce it. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Now, of course, some of you might know Ger uh, Bernard Shaw's play Pygmalion. Professor Higgins was actually based on this character. He went on to become a musical, um, uh, uh, what's it called? My Fair Lady, yeah? And there it is. Uh, Alexander Melville Bell, he wrote a book called The Standard Elocutionist. So he was always really interested in speech. And Alexander Graham Bell, he worked with his father, and he, 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 he got to understand it himself. And he loved experimenting and making things. When, when Alexander Graham Bell was just 12 years old, he and his best friend Ben from next door, they made this. It's a de-husking machine. And they used that for many years. But in the, same, in the same year, things began to get bad. You see, his, his mother uh, began to lose her hearing, Eliza. And, 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 and so Bell had to find ways of communicating with her. So, uh, so he, he, he learned a bit of lip reading. He learned a bit of sign language. And, but he used, to, uh, he used to communicate in a particular way. He used to go right up to her forehead and speak in low, booming tones. And in, in order to understand how this worked, we need to know something about sound. So let's have another couple of volunteers, perhaps a couple of people from the back or one or two children here. Who else wants to You look as if you need to volunteer, man. Give a round of applause. Come on, let's have a couple. Now, I need three people. I need three people. Come on, madam. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, yeah, she's bringing them on. There you go. Okay, mind the wires here. So you're going to get to do these ones. So there you go. You have those two. And you have these two, madam. There you go. And all I want you to do is just twist the string around your finger like that and stick your fingers in your ears, okay? And lean forward like that, okay? Now you get, what's your name again? Evan, you get the big one okay so evan you twist your, this around your finger like that twist it around your finger twist it around twist it around twist it around you got that okay stick your finger in your ear and wrist finger as well twist it around your finger you got it Oop, hold your finger it's quite heavy can you hold that are you strong enough for that there you go there you go stick it in your ear lean forwards okay ready here we go Lean forward so it's not touching your trousers. Are you ready for this? Now point your head up so they can see your face. Ready? Can you hear that? Can you hear it? Okay. And you can crash yours together. Yeah. She's laughing. You get that? Yeah. And you're never going to know until you do it what they heard. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Pretty amazing, huh? So you see. Sound is basically made of vibrations and is sending the vibrations along the strings which conduct much better than the air to reach the bones of the body. And this is how Alexander Graham Bell spoke to his mother. He put his head up against her forehead and he, he, he made those vibrations go straight into the bones of her head and she heard them. You see, sound is made of vibrations. This little music box here, isn't it lovely? It's got little metal reeds and ridges on this here that uh, when, they, when they come along, they, they, they twang the reed and it makes a lovely sound. Now we can't hear it very well, so we gotta amplify it by putting it onto something like this guitar bar. And that is what sound is. Sound is uh, vibrations, okay? It's vibrations. Now, uh, Alexander Graham Bell's father, he showed him this, this invention. This was invented by a Frenchman, Edouard Leon Scott de Massé. And he invented this, and it's, it's, it's almost, you could say, the precursor of a gramophone. You see, uh, you would speak into this cone here, and then your voice would hit the diaphragm here, and a needle would engrave a, a, a mark onto this paper here. In fact, you could put a pencil here, and you would get a visible uh, a, a souvenir of what you had said. Well, Bell, uh, he made a similar device actually using the remains of a human ear. There we go. And of course, if you want to find out more about sound as vibrations, you can do worse than check out this extraordinary woman, Evelyn Glennie, one of the greatest percussionists in the world who is deaf herself. Well, 
Alexander Graham Bell, he got to make, invent machines and, 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 and find out about sound. But then when he was 23 years old, tragedy struck. His, uh, his two brothers contracted tuber tuberculosis and died. And he himself became very ill. And so his family moved across to Canada. Well, he had to get a job and he went down to Boston, Massachusetts. Where, uh, where he took up a job in a, uh, a school for the deaf. It was Sarah Fuller's School for the Deaf. And there he is, you can see, there's Mr. Bell, the young Mr. Bell there. And he proved to be an excellent teacher. And he enjoyed it. He always loved his whole life working with the deaf. In fact, uh, he, is, he then went on to set up his own school with a snappy title of the School of Vocal Physiology and the Mechanics of Speech. And uh, one of his most famous pupils was this lady, Helen Keller who was not only deaf, but also blind as well, and, uh, and dumb. And she went on to become a great political activist and, and author, and she thanked uh, Mr. Alexander Graham Bell, and there they are in, uh, in, in, in his later life. So <clears throat> he, was, he, was, uh, he was teaching, and he was experimenting. But all of this work began to take its toll. So he took a risk. He decided to give up uh, the teaching so he could concentrate on his experiments. And one in particular he was making, which he called the harmonic telegraph. And to understand this, we need to know a little bit about frequencies and harmonics. Well, the frequency is how often something occurs. If I was, uh, if I was standing at the edge of those waves, you can see the purple ones here, if they were moving, they would arrive at, at me very frequently. That's what we call a high frequency, whereas the red at the top is a much lower frequency. And when you come to uh, sound, the lower sounds have a lower frequency and the higher sounds have a higher frequency. So if you can make a wave which is long, It'll be a low frequency. And uh, if you make a, a, a short wave, which is much shorter, it's obviously higher. And you can have a bit of fun with that. And uh, you can try it at home too, with lots of different things. And of course the frequencies change. Uh, and you can even make yourself a little symphony orchestra. According to the uh, uh, size of those waves, uh, the um, the volume of the wave, well, the volume of the sound that is affected by what we call the amplitude, which is the height of the wave itself. But there's another, there's another. Oh, and of course, uh, here we go. We can also demonstrate it with a guitar string. The shorter the string. The, uh, the higher the note. But of course you've got something else which can happen on a guitar string. You see, I'm not actually pressing it down and yet I can get that note. How is this happening? Well, this is something called uh, uh, harmonics. Um, you, you'll notice, well actually let me, let me show you. Can I have another volunteer? Shall we have the same volunteer? <laughs> you want to? Yes! Your round of applause, please, round of applause. Okay. So, all you have to do, madam, is just simply hold this. If you go over that side of the stage, that's right. Okay. And we'll show you what our harmonics are. So, you hold it nice and sterile. So, one wave might look a little bit like that, okay? But if I spin it a bit faster and get it right, there you go. You got two waves there, yeah? With a bit in the middle which is not moving, that's called the node. And the bits that are moving is the anti-node. If I go even faster, I may be able to get free. I don't know. I'm not sure. Give him a round of applause anyway. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. So, you see, you can get different frequencies. That's why they can play different tunes on one piece of tube in the same length. And, of course, this one you may also like to experiment with for Christmas. Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is called uh, uh, harmonics, you see. Okay, where did I put my little switchy thing? There it is, over there. Okay, now, uh, there is one rather great way of seeing how things vibrate, uh, and, and, and it's, it's this over here. Now, you can make yourself one of these. Uh, let me just show you. This is what is known as a vocal visualizer. May we, may we dim the lights, please? 
There's a laser light coming to a mirror on here. Oh, and if I speak, you can see how my voice is affecting the balloon. Ooh. There you go. Ooh. And you can make yourself. Who wants to? Do you want to have a go? You want to have a go? There you go. Let's get it in line. There you go. <laughs> and again. Fantastic. Give a round of applause. You want to go? There you go. Go on, make a big noise. There you go. <laughs> round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Okay, you can, uh, you can easily make your own one of those. There you go, just visit that website. We'll, we'll send you a little link for that later on, and you can create your own in no time flat. Well, uh, and of course, when I got here, they said, here, have some nice telephonic mugs, because you can actually do a little lovely little demonstration with this at home too. You see, you may know that a mug has a sound, right? Okay, what you may not have realized is this. You see, uh, you probably know that a smaller mug has a higher pitch than a, a bigger mug. But what you may not have realized is that a bigger mug, in fact any mug, has two pitches. How can that be when it's the same size mug? Well, it's about the way that it vibrates. You remember those, those nodes? That, we, that I showed you earlier? Well, where the node is on the handle itself, uh, like here, uh, th by, uh, then, then the, uh, the, the, the handle itself doesn't need to be moving, and so you get a different frequency to where if the handle itself is having to move and the mug is effectively a heavier mug. And so there you go, and that you'll find in that book over there. So there's a bit of science you could do yourselves. Resonant frequencies. You probably experience them when you're on the swing, you've heard them on the guitar, and when you get home singing in the shower, there's certain notes that are picked up really well. And it all depends on the size of that wave. Uh, now you're probably aware of this. Who, who's ever done this? You take a ruler and you strap it on there because you get a different frequency according to the length of the ruler. Well, we started doing this with metal uh, uh, pieces of uh, metal, metal reeds, we call them, uh, held above an electromagnet. Now, what would happen? Can we actually get, uh, can we actually get movement from, uh, from, from that? from electromagnetism? Well, yes, we've seen it. It moves the compass needle. You can pick things up, you can create motors. So if you've got an electric current and you've got magnetism, you can create movement. But the question is, can you actually create sound? Well, you should be able to. You should be able to. Let me show you. Okay, so what I got here, let me just come out of this for a second. There you go. Now, a loudspeaker here has got a magnet on the back and a coil inside. And as electricity goes into the coil, it's going to create a current which is going to make the coil into an electromagnet. This is going to either attract or repel this from the, the speaker. And as you can see, the speaker cone starts moving. Now, if I turn up the volume, it moves more. That's the amplitude. Turn it down, it doesn't move so much. So we are creating movement from electricity, varying the amount of electricity and the direction. But how come you can't hear it? Well, let's try speeding it up a little. Now you're beginning to hear it. Would you like to step up here? And you can still feel those vibrations, yeah? Come around here so that they can still see. Can you feel the air vibrating in front of it, yeah? Still feel the air. Now it doesn't actually look as if it's moving, but it is. Can you still feel the vibrations? Do you want to feel the vibrations? Come on, feel the vibrations. Do you want to feel the vibrations? So even though we can't see it moving, you feel it vibrating? And the higher the frequency, the faster it vibrates. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. So. 
there we go. So uh, we can actually create sound from, uh, from the uh, movement. Okay, so can electricity create movement? Yes. Can electricity therefore create sound? Yes, it can. But what about the other way round? Can, uh, can we create electricity from sound? Can we create electricity from sound? Well, sound is basically uh, movement, isn't it? We've seen that. It's vibrations. Can movement create electricity? Well, what if what was moving was actually a magnet? Can I have another volunteer? Does it, come on, then. Come, could you come and hold this here? Right. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to use magnetism. Now, uh, here's a little meter here. And I'd like you to just hold this uh, by this man's camera. Can you take that? Yeah, and get, he'll show you where to hold it. There you go. Now, I've got a coil here. Hold it up. Hold it up there. Lift it up in front of the lens there. There you go. Now, I got a coil of wire here, and I got a magnet here. Now, can you see the needle on there? Can you focus that? OK. There you go. Can you adjust the focus on that at all? There you go. Go back a little bit, a little bit back. There you go. That's it. Now watch closely. As I put the magnet into the coil, does it move? Just a tiny kick one way and a tiny kick the other way. When you put a magnet into a coil, it moves. So we are creating electricity simply by moving a magnet close to a coil of wire. Well, if you can use movement to create electricity, you can use sound to create electricity. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. So, yes, we can create it. We have sound giving electricity. We have electricity giving sound. We had all the ingredients we needed to make a harmonic telegraph. So we set up the equipment. We set it up. I was in one room with some of the equipment. Uh, Mr. Bell was in another room. I found one of those reeds. You see, you remember my little musical box there? It had the little reeds, the twang at certain frequency, like the ruler. Well, one of them was stuck, wasn't it? So I twanged it to release it and goodness knows do you know what happened mr. Bell he heard one of the reeds in his room also vibrating the electricity had carried the frequency of vibrations of my reed into his room and because it was the resonant frequency of his reed it had picked it up we had transmitted sound from one room to another across electrical wires well this was quite extraordinary, but I, I, harmonic telegraph, you see, if you have differently tuned reeds with different harmonics, you, you could send a four signals simultaneously along the same wire. Well, of course, the, the, the backers, they love this. They could get four times as many messages sold without having to lay any more cables anywhere. So, uh, Mr. Bell, he took his, his harmonic telegraph to Professor Joseph Henry, who looked at it. and. Uh, and he, he showed him this. I, 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 but Mr. Bell, he said, look, look, uh, Mr. Henry, I think we can do more than this. If, if, if a sound can be picked up, then could we perhaps create a telephone? Well, what a germ of a great idea, said Mr. Henry. But, said Mr. Bell, I lack the inevitable knowledge. And so he said, then... Exactly, and he got it. He got me, Thomas Watson, electrical engineer. So how we were going to work on this. We had the knowledge of sound. We had the knowledge of electricity. Put them together. All we needed was the backing, the finance to do this. Uh, but the backers, they said, no, we don't want that. Why should we invest our money in a telephone? We've already got a system, the telegraph. And, and, and this, this can create us money. Your harmonic telegraph can get us four times as much money for no extra outlay. Wonderful. So what were we going to do? We had to get some money from somewhere. Well, Mr. Bell remembered his pupils from his school of the deaf. And one pupil in particular would always spring into his mind. Her name was Mabel, Mabel Gardner, Mabel Gardner Hubbard. Now, Mabel Gardner Hubbard, uh, she was the daughter of a very wealthy lawyer, a, a lawyer and, and, and a, a, a social benefactor. Of, uh, and he, he had lots of money. And Mr. Bell thought, well, if I was to ask 
Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner Hubbard for some money. Well, maybe I could make my invention and then Mabel, he would think of me as a suitable man for his daughter Mabel. She, he would never consider me for his daughter as a humble teacher. So, he took his courage and he went to speak to Mr. Uh, Gardner Hubbard. And Gardner Hubbard, being a lawyer, said, well, if you want some money, you're first going to have to get a patent. When you've got a patent, no one else can work on your ideas. If you get a patent, I will give you the money, and then you can work on your telephone. And he thought, if I work on my telephone, then I may get uh, to marry Mabel. So, as quickly as we could, we put together the, the designs and the plans for the patent. And on Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day, 1876, the patent office in Boston, Massachusetts was abuzz with activity. And through the streets came Mr. Bell's messenger in the horse and carriage and arrived at the patent office just two hours, two hours before Alicia Gray's man arrived to submit the same patent. And he won the patent. He won the patent. And this meant uh, that he could work on the telephone, and perhaps win his beloved Mabel. Well, that is in fact what happened, and they did get married, and they were married happily for, uh, for, 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 for 45 years, and a great partnership too. She's an amazing woman. So, back to our work. We set to work on the invention. Uh, we had the patent now, and less than a month after we received it, on the 10th of March, uh, uh, on the 10th of March, 1876, I was upstairs in an attic. Mr. Bell was in a different room, on a different floor of the house, and he spilled some battery acid. You remember the battery acid? He spilled some, and I heard a cry. Watson, come here, I want you. I heard that cry coming from the, uh, the, 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 our apparatus. I heard it. It was the first words ever to be, to be transmitted through a wire to another place, albeit only a few feet away, but we had done it. And my name, Mr. Watson, were the first words ever spoken on a telephone. Well, we, we, we knew we had the, 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 an idea with it would work, and we carried on working. We soon created the world's first telephone, and, uh, and we created a company to, to, to launch it, the Bell Telephone Company, and Mr. Gardner Hubbard, he set up some lectures for us to introduce our ideas to the general public. Of course, things, uh, things improved and got, got much faster and much better. Uh, it, well, Mr. Edison, it is said, created a whole new kind of microphone. So we didn't use electromagnetism, but instead carbon grains, which change their resistance when they're squashed or not. And so new microphones were set up. And this invention was, for, of course, made by Thomas Watson. Actually, not Thomas Watson and not Thomas Edison, but Henry Hunnings. Henry Hunnings from Pocklington, near York. Henry Huntings in Pocklington, New York, I, I learned today, actually invented the carbon microphone. Isn't that amazing? Well, of course, when telephones were first brought out, they were very expensive, and everything had to change. You know, uh, servants had books they had to read about the etiquette of answering the phone. How could they pass a message and, and, and fetch their masters and mistresses? And of course, other things change too. I mean, for example, let's say you, young lady, were going to have a little liaison with this handsome man here. Well, of course, back in the day, there is no way he could come to speak to you without actually coming to your house. And of course, your parents, your father here, would be around <laughs> to monitor everything that's going on. But now, we had a telephone, young ladies could speak to well, who knows who? <laughs> it was absolutely scandalous and outrageous, and the whole of society began to change. Of course, the early telephones, you needed to uh, speak pretty loudly to be heard. And so, for a bit of privacy, they created telephone boxes. And there you go. And if you want to know anything about telephone boxes, this is the book you need to read, and that is the man you need to speak to. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yep, Mr. Martin Lega, he, there he is. He's written this book here. So, uh, 
society, society changed. And of course, telephones changed over the years, you know. Um, in just nine years, over 150,000 people across the United States had a telephone. And, uh, you know, in the year that we got the patent, uh, they offered it. We, we, we offered the uh, 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 share in this patent to the, uh, in fact, we offered to sell the patent to the Western Union Company for $100,000. And they turned it down. They turned it down. And of course, the Bell Telephone Company went on to be the most wealthy company in the world. <laughs> in fact, just two years later, the uh, uh, chief executive of the uh, Western Union was heard to say, if I could get that patent now for $25 million, I'd consider it a bargain. But by that time, it was too late. Of course, uh, telephones changed, and then eventually mobile phones were made, cellular phones. And again, if you want to know anything about it, there's your man, just there and there, the authors of this wonderful book, 30 Years of a Mobile Telephone. These days, of course, there are thousands to choose from. Who here has a mobile? A telephone, a cellular phone, and cross. It's a fascinating history. Well, uh, Mr. Bell, of course, he's famous for inventing the telephone. But that wasn't all he worked on. And in fact, he didn't like being thought of as simply the inventor of the telephone. He invented all sorts of other things too. He worked on the early gramophones, wax discs. He invented the iron lung. Uh, he, uh, he, he invented a device for detecting icebergs. All sorts of ideas he had, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of which have become a reality today, such as hydrofoils, ships that could travel 70 miles an hour because of the lower contact with the surface of the water. He invented that. He came up with the idea of solar panels. And of course, with Mr. Gardner Hubbard, he founded National Geographic magazine. Oh, he also uh, invented metal detectors. But you know, one of his favorite things was this. There, what's that shape called? You want to know what that shape is? Tetrahedron, that's right. These are tetrahedrons because uh, they got four corners, you see. Now, he loved tetrahedrons, did Mr. Bell, and he, he made some rather lovely devices. And you can do this yourself. You can make yourself some little tetrahedrons. Stick them together and make yourself a kite. And Mr. Bell, he thought that wouldn't it be great if we could actually get a, a kite uh, with such a powerful lift, it could actually lift a man off the ground. And he envisaged flight and using kites for flight. And he did a lot, of, a lot of work into that. But you know, one of my favorite inventions of Mr. Bell, and this is absolutely true, was the photo phone. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in, in April, uh, April 1880, Mr. Bell used a phone which did not transmit by electricity, but it transmitted its signals by using light. Sunlight comes in. It is bounced from a flexible mirror inside here. The voice, of course, makes the mirror change, concave, convex, concave, convex. So the intensity of the, of the light coming out of the phone changes according to the sound of the voice. It was on his honeymoon that Mr. Bell had discovered that selenium cells would actually change their resistance to electricity by the amount of light hitting them. And so the receiver had selenium cells at the focal point, and people were allowed, able to communicate using light. Back on that April day, we communicated from the top of the roof of a school into Mr. Bell's laboratory. It was, it was some, some 79 meters. Uh, but it wasn't long before we, we, we transmitted 700 feet. In June, we, we transmitted 700 feet using simply plain sunlight as our source of energy. Now, some would say that that is the precursor of something pretty special, which we use today. And hands up if you work on this. Fiber optics, yes? <laughs> this is the precursor, isn't it? Nowadays, signals are sent around the world for the internet, for telephones, by using light. The fastest thing that we get. And so, you could say it's the precursor of that. So Mr. Bell, he was a pretty incredible man. And you know, he said many wise things. Pre before anything else, preparation is the key to success. I love this. A man is what he makes of himself. You've got to know exactly what you want and be fully determined not to quit until you get it. 
What great advice. Sometimes we stare so long at a door that is closing that we see too late the one that is open for us. And finally, concentrate all your thoughts on the work at hand. The sun's rays do not burn till brought to a focus. Now, you know, one of my favorite things that Mr. Bell ever said was this. You see, as you know, I was an electrician, uh, and, and he knew about sound. He said, I now realize I should never have invented the telephone had I been an electrician. Which electrician would have been foolish enough to even try such a thing? The advantage I had was that sound had been the study of my life, the study of vibrations. Now, when Mr. Bell died in 1922, the telephones went silent across the United States as a mark of respect for him. And Mr. Bell, you know, he never had a telephone in his own uh, office. He said that it would interfere with his work. And so I think we have a lot to thank for this man. Uh, whether or not it's an intrusion on your life and work, uh, or an in on his, here we have Mr. Alexander Graham Bell, who certainly changed our lives. And there he is with his favorite shape and his favorite young lady, his wife, Mabel. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alexander Graham Bell. Thank you.